Good evening, and a very warm welcome from the New York University Stern School of Business to all students, alumni, faculty, administrators, Fed guests, and members of the press. It is my privilege today to introduce our esteemed guest, Dr. Janet Yellen, Chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System for the third installment of the In Conversation with Mervyn King series. Janet Yellen took office as the Chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and Chair of the Federal Open Market Committee, the system's principal monetary policy-making body, in February 2014. The first woman to serve in this influential position, Chair Yellen presides over the nation's monetary policy. Prior to her appointment as chair, Dr. Yellen was vice chair of the Board of Governors, president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, among many prestigious roles in her long-standing career in public service. As arguably the most powerful woman in the world today, Janet Yellen needs no further introduction. <laughs> A celebrated academic, engaged public servant, and pioneering role model, we are thrilled to have her with us today. <laughs> Joining Chair Yellen on stage is our very own NYU Stern professor, Lord Mervyn King. Lord King joined Stern three years ago as a professor of economics and law, a joint appointment with the NYU School of Law after serving as governor of the Bank of England for 10 years. Given their extraordinary backgrounds and professional experiences, we're, we're in for a fascinating conversation tonight, and we will invite you to participate during the audience Q&A a little later in the evening. But now, please join me in welcoming Chair Janet Yellen and Lord Mervyn King. Hello, good evening, and welcome to this In Conversation event. Janet Yellen and I will be in conversation for about half an hour or so, and then we shall turn to some of your questions. You should all have a card which you received when you entered the auditorium. And if you would like to ask a question, please put your name, affiliation, whether you're a student, and the question on the card. And at a couple of points, uh, we'll tell you, just pass the cards to the aisles, and volunteers will come round and collect them. Janet, thank you so much for coming to Stern this evening. My pleasure. Yesterday you announced that you will be standing down from the Board of Governors of the Fed after your successor has been sworn in, so freedom beckons. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I'd like to, to ask you to cast your mind back over the past four years. When you became Chair of the Fed four years ago, you were already a very experienced central bank policymaker, and a lifelong economist. So you didn't come with a blank sheet of paper. You had clear views already. But what, what lessons, what new lessons, have you learned from the experience of the past four years? Well, so as an economist, um, you and I have studied lots of economic theory and read economic history. And when you move into policy jobs, um, you often have, or at least I, cer I certainly had pretty strong views about how the economy works and how to interpret data. Um, but I would say one of the most important things I learned as chair and thought was important to making good policy is to keep an open mind and um, not to simply assume that history is repeating itself. There are always new features, things are always changing, there are always puzzles that um, one needs to look at objectively, to analyze, and to really try to figure out what is going on rather than what you thought um, should be going on. Um, so I guess I could give you some illustrations of yeah. how that's played out for us. Um, when I became chair, um, we, we had put into place massive amounts of accommodation. And of course, you did something quite similar at the Bank of England to address the horrendous economic toll that the financial crisis had taken. But the economy was really recovering. Unemployment had fallen from um, roughly 10% where it peaked in the United States. Um, by the time I became chair, 
it was just over 6.5%. And we were still purchasing assets, but my predecessor, Ben Bernanke, had started the process of uh, tapering our asset purchases. And I guess I saw it as my own job. Um, hopefully, the economy would cooperate, and we would be in a process of normalizing monetary policy. First, um, ceasing, gradually ceasing our purchases, hopefully later beginning to raise the federal funds rate, our short-term interest rate target, um, off zero back toward more normal levels, and hopefully later, somewhere down the line, beginning to actually shrink our balance sheet, which had risen from something like a trillion dollars before the crisis to it peaked at four and a half trillion dollars. Mm. So we did massive asset mm. purchases. Now, um, our committee every three months um, publishes each individual participant's forecasts of what the economy, GDP growth, the unemployment rate, inflation will be over the forecast horizon of several years. And they also write down what they think appropriate policy is. So um, at the beginning of uh, 2015, or the end of 2014, my colleagues um, issued forecasts in which they envisioned that we would be raising the federal funds rate four times in 2015 and another four times in 2016, a gradual path mm -hmm. by historical standards, mm -hmm. but nevertheless some significant increases. Well, as it turns out, history turned out very differently. Mm -hmm. We ended up raising the federal funds rate once in 2015 and once in 2016. And I would say it was because um, we tried to maintain open minds and to mm -hmm. look at incoming data and not to get stuck. We said such and such, and therefore we have That's to carry it. through. Yeah. But rather, we called it data dependence at the time, but I would say it's an openness to really trying to understand what's happening in the economy and adjust rather than to stay locked in. And as it happens, a couple of things were happening. First, there were a series of shocks, a lot of turbulence, particularly coming out of um, Europe and emerging markets, um, a large decline in oil prices, um, a huge appreciation of the dollar, and all those things had significant impacts on our forecast and also our assessment of risks. And although um, markets seemed to be expecting that we would raise the federal funds rate four times that year, we thought it was the wrong thing to do, and we didn't do it. But the, the other thing I'd say is that we were also engaging in a more fundamental rethink of how the economy works and not assuming that the new normal would be the same as the old normal. And in particular, when I use the term normalizing monetary mm. policy, well, historically, an average level for the federal funds rate might have been something, oh, close to 4% or a little bit over. Um, but what we saw was, you know, we had, during the crisis, we stepped on the gas massively. We cut short-term rates to zero. We did these huge asset purchases. And it took all of that accommodation to get the economy just barely moving fast enough to begin to erode slack in the labor market. And gee, we had for many years, we had to continue doing that. And why was that? Well, I guess what we decided in a growing academic literature seemed to show is that even before the crisis, um, interest rates had been gradually moving down throughout the developed world. And the so-called neutral rate of interest or the level of interest rates that would be consistent with the economy essentially growing at potential. It looked like instead of being four or four and a half percent, that it had moved way down. And my colleagues and I began to realize, gee, the new normal was very different. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> we, over the succeeding years, two and a half years, we have been revising down our estimate of this longer run normal rate of interest. 
and market participants have, doing, have been doing the same. They may be even a little bit ahead of us, but that also led to a big rethink about how much we would actually need to raise the Fed funds rate. Um, we changed our views about what the normal longer run rate of unemployment was also. Um, uh, as we saw, we had declining unemployment and inflation stayed very low. So flexibility is one thing I think is important. I'd say the other thing that I learned or I discovered was important is um, very careful preparation and um, deliberations um, among participants in the committee in order to mm -hmm. really carefully think through a strategy and try to develop a consensus before presenting it to the public. So recently in, in um, October, uh, we began the process of shrinking our balance sheet. But getting to the point of starting that process involved um, well over a year of discussions in the committee about how we could do that in a way that the public would understand what we had in mind, how we would use our balance sheet, and to do it in a way that wouldn't be disruptive to financial markets. So knock wood, um, <laughs> things so far so good, I think. Well, I can certainly tell the audience that I've come across few central bankers as well prepared as you. <laughs> uh, but the key, the, the key seems to be that central banks must keep open a willingness and an ability to be self-confident about saying that we've changed our mind and, and we've learned. Yes, I, I think that's, that's absolutely right. right. I mean, you know, very important things about how the economy functions yeah. aren't constant over time and um, it's important that we adjust our thinking. So can I take you back to your first day four years ago? What actually happens when a a new chair arrives. Are they sworn? Is there a swearing in ceremony? Who swears in the chair? What actually happened? So, the um, morning of February 3rd, 2014, um, I was sworn in by my, the most senior of my colleagues, right. who at the time was Dan, Dan Terullo. Mm -hmm. um, we had a very <coughs> small ceremony in our boardroom, uh, just uh, a handful of staff were present. And um, I took the oath of office and got to work. Uh, about six weeks later, there was a large, what we call ceremonial, swearing in, which was um, a large event. My family came to, the oh. board, the staff of the Fed came to, and quite a number of outsiders. Right. And that was a more celebratory moment with um, speeches given. Champagne? Um, uh, well, it's a work day after all, Merlin, so I don't know. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I meant. Well, we're not, it's, it's we're what... not, <laughs> uh, we, we saved that for the, the family treat in the evening. But, Splendid. Um, <laughs> I think we did. Um, but I got right to work. So right. on, on the real first day, um, I was slated to testify before Congress the very next week. So one of our traditions is that um, the Fed chair has to give monetary policy testimony in both the Senate to the Senate Banking Committee and House Financial Services Committee in two successive days uh, every February and every July, and that's mandated by law. And so the very following week, um, I was slated to go right. testify, and it is a very rigorous yeah. process of preparing for that and I think less than a month away um, was to be my very first FOMC meeting. And we were at a point of having to make some mm -hmm. significant changes. And so I quickly started meeting with staff. But, you know, one of the things also that I recall doing on the first day in the office was um, preparing a video message for our staff. Mm -hmm. uh, when there's a change of leadership, I think... Mm -hmm. Um, it's important that people throughout the organization begin to feel connected and know what the values and sort of priorities are of the person who's um, going to be at the helm. Now, it probably wasn't any great surprise um, to the staff 
what I would have to say. I had been vice chair. I had been in San Francisco. I had been a staff member earlier in my career. So I had long you know, affiliation with the board. Nevertheless, um, I did prepare a video message in which um, I talked about the values of our organization, um, our commitment to professionalism, to public service, to um, uh, acting with integrity in a nonpartisan way, and our commitment to a strong economy and financial system. So four weeks in, first FOMC meeting. Well, what's the atmosphere like at an FOMC meeting? The transcripts are now made public five years later, so people must be a bit conscious of that. Is it f rather formal, or do sometimes people say things that surprise you? What, what is it like being in an FOMC meeting? So we're in a um, very elegant, historic room and seated around a massive board table. And I think the elegance of the room and its history um, give people the feeling or intensify the feeling that they would probably in any event have that we are here to do important business and the decisions we make are consequential. So certainly there is a sense of seriousness um, among the people around the table. And of course we are, as you said, um, I guess it was back in around 1994 and 95 that the, the Federal Reserve started making transcripts, verbatim transcripts of meetings public. They're published with a five-year lag, but um, you know that you were speaking for history, mm. and um, people do tend, as you indicated, to be pretty careful about what they say. Um, they are well prepared for meetings, I mean, in part just because it is serious business, but the fact that there are transcripts and that people will be able to look back um, and see what you really said um, and analyze, you know, analyze mm. the quality of your reasoning and thinking um, does create a kind of formality, but it isn't totally formal. And when the transcripts come out, they get a lot of attention in the newspaper. So probably, the, the, let's see, the 2011 transcripts are the last ones that are in the public domain, but in January, the 2012 transcripts will be issued and journalists tend to immediately start reading them and there are blogs and as they uncover things they start um, writing them in blogs in real time so people can see what they thought was interesting. But one thing they always do, and you can do too on the web, is search for the word laughter in the transcripts. Ah. Um, because people, it's not so formal that people don't tell jokes. Now, I, I'm not going to vouch for the quality of the jokes, <laughs> but um, there are jokes. And when people break into laughter, um, the transcript says la laughter, you know, laughter is in the room. Splendid. And um, also my predecessor, the, in, your friend Ben Bernanke. He didn't um, crack many jokes, I don't think. But. <laughs> He was, he was, it was pretty serious times, a dark, dark humor during yeah, no dark his, humor, yeah. his days. But um, he, he wanted to create a more informal environment mm. uh, in the boardroom for our deliberations. It's hard to do, but he encouraged what in seminars we call two-handed interventions. Mm -hmm. that, that means rather than just raising your hands and saying, I'd like to be recognized when my turn comes, you could raise your hand and... Um, essentially be immediately mm -hmm. recognized. Typically you would do that if you want to react to something that someone has just said and quiz that person mm -hmm. and have a little interchange rather than um, wait 45 minutes until your turn comes. And so there are, there is back and forth yeah. that kind of follows that format. And Often people seem to forget that the tape recorder is on and what they're saying will be, um, you know, hmm. verbatim. Um, and there is a certain informality, hmm. but, but it is serious business. I, I hadn't realized there were these two-handed interventions, which is crucial, I think, to some sort of toing and froing. And 
Yeah, and same. I look forward to reading the jokes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, they're easy to find. There are not that many of them, but there, there are some. Well, so. we, we publish a compendium of them <laughs> after 50 years. <laughs> so let me ask you about the relationship that you had with what we would call in London the other side of town. So since the financial crisis, the central banks and finance ministries, the Treasury here, have had to work much more closely together, given the nature of policies that both were putting in place. So how does that relationship work? I mean, did you have regular breakfasts or lunches or dinners with the Treasury Secretary? How is the relationship, both at your level and maybe more generally in the organization, between the two ends? So there is a long tradition of cooperation between the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, um, the White House, the Council of Economic Advisors, and regular meetings. So my predecessors all had a tradition. I'm not sure quite how far back it goes, but um, certainly to Greenspan, if not before, that the Fed chair and the Treasury Secretary get together regularly for breakfast or lunch. And I've continued that tradition. I used to get together regularly with Jack Lou, who mm -hmm. was Treasury Secretary when I was named chair. And now I get together regularly with Steve Mnuchin, mm -hmm. who's um, Treasury, uh, Treasury Secretary at the moment. Um, I also have regular lunches with Gary Cohn, who mm -hmm heads the National Economic Council in the White House, and there is a very long tradition of the full board of governors um, gets together with the members of the Council of Economic Advisors for an informal lunch. And I guess, um, you know, th these interactions follow certain rules. The key rule is that the Federal Reserve is independent within government. And I... Um, it's, it's recognized that um, the Federal Reserve has the ability uh, to make its own decisions about monetary policy. And all of those um, uh, officials that I mentioned recognize that, respect it, and um, would not offer advice or criticism of monetary policy decisions. But we would talk about the economy. Um, if the Fed had made decisions, I certainly would want to make sure that the Treasury Secretary, uh, that the White House understood the logic of the decisions and um, what the basis was for them. We would share reflections on the economy. And we also cooperate and have joint responsibility for financial regulation. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin and I participate in the Financial Stability Oversight Council. Um, we discuss matters become, that will be coming before that body, threats to financial stability. And of course, as you mentioned, and um, this was really something more, something that my predecessor um, had to deal with when we had a financial crisis and put in place massive liquidity programs to try to stem damage to the financial system and the economy. Sometimes there were joint um, efforts by the Treasury Secretary and, mm -hmm. and the Fed by the administration. If the Fed, different rules, but cooperation in trying to um, address uh, extreme financial crisis. So looking ahead now, what, what do you think are likely to be the biggest challenges facing the Fed over the next few years? Well, let me mainly focus on monetary policy, mm -hmm. but I'd like to also say a couple of words about financial regulation, mm -hmm. too. Um, on monetary <coughs> policy, in, in a sense, we have a fixed set of goals. Uh, for us, we have two goals that are mandated by Congress, their maximum employment and price stability, which we've defined uh, or interpreted and defined as 2% inflation. And um, it's a question of trying to achieve those goals and once achieved, maintain them. I mean, I guess I'm pleased to say at the moment that we're reasonably close after 
you know, the financial crisis when unemployment was as high as 10 percent and inflation dropped to very low levels. Um, we now have a 4.1 percent unemployment rate, which um, is consistent or even slightly below most estimates of a rate that's sustainable in the longer run. Inflation, on the other hand, is actually running below our 2 percent objective. Mm -hmm. It's been um, only around a little bit under 1.5 percent over the last 12 months. So, um, you know, the, the issues facing monetary policy at the moment, I would say, is how to craft a monetary policy that maintains a strong labor market but also moves inflation back up to our 2 percent objective. And we've been on a course in thinking it's appropriate to gradually raise interest rates toward normal levels, but ones that, you know, as I indicated previously, I think will be regarded as low levels by historical standards. But there are risks, and policymakers will have to evaluate the risks, and the risks are two-sided. On the one hand, um, if we remove policy accommodation too rapidly, well, in the extreme, that could cause a downturn in the economy. Um, but um, perhaps as relevant at the moment is that we might leave inflation, inflation might not move back to our 2 percent objective, and we might become stuck with an inflation rate that doesn't get back to 2 percent. And you might think, well, I mean, a lot of people, I think, feel, well, low inflation is desirable, and what's, what's wrong with having 1.5 percent inflation rather than 2 percent inflation? But actually, it can be quite dangerous to allow inflation to drift down and not to achieve over time a central bank's inflation target. Um, one reason it's dangerous is because inflation expectations are likely to also drift down. And indeed, there is some evidence. I don't really think they've drifted down very much, but there is some suggestion, some hint that after many years now of low inflation, they may be drifting down. And that would be a very undesirable state of affairs. Um, the lower inflation is, the lower are the average levels of interest rates in the economy. And um, I said, anyhow, we think the norm, new normal is going to be a world where interest rates are low. If we do have a downturn, so at some future year, there's the, the economy is hit by a negative shock, um, central banks need to have the tools to respond to another downturn to try to limit its consequence for the job market and for inflation. But, gee, how much room will we have when the normal level of interest rates is 4.5% or 5%? Well, you can then, if you have a negative shock, cut them by 5%. Well, now we're thinking our committee um, median estimate of the longer run normal rate of interest is only two and three quarters percent. And if inflation falls below two percent, that would okay. that would come down too. And that's not a lot of scope to use monetary policy to address weakness. So that would be a very dangerous state of affairs. And so removing policy accommodation too quickly risks leaving inflation below our target with all those dangers. On the other hand, um, removing policy accommodation too slowly also has risks, and the labor market could tighten um, very quickly and move to levels that are um, way below those judged to be sustainable over the longer term. Um, inflation at very low levels of unemployment could, I'm not sure this would happen, I think the evidence is very limited, but it is a risk that it could move up quickly, forcing us to tighten monetary policy and cause a recession. And we don't want a boom-bust policy. We want an economy with a good, strong job market that um, is stable and has a stable, strong job market as opposed to 
one that follows cycles of boom and bust. So that's the main, we need to continue to shrink our balance sheet. And I think those are the main, main things. On financial regulation, I mean, it, as you know, um, central banks and policymakers more generally, supervisors, uh, really worked very hard after the crisis to um, try to promote a more stable, better capitalized banking system, one that's stronger, more resilient to shocks, and less crisis prone. And I feel we've put in place um, regulations that demand higher capital, more liquidity. We have a rigorous regime of stress testing, particularly the largest and most systemic banks. We've forced them to um, greatly improve their risk management um, techniques so they better understand the risks on their own balance sheets. And we have required them to engage in resolution planning so that um, a firm that encounters trouble um, rather than being bailed out again actually could be resolved and we've worked hard on that and I really think um, it's important that those things stay in place so we have a sound and resilient financial system. Excellent. Now this may be a, the point to say this is the first time that I shall suggest that those of you who've got questions might pass them to the aisles and our volunteers will then come down and collect them and then eventually they will find their way to me. Can I turn the, the discussion now towards communication? Really for 25 years now, communication has been a, a big thing for central banks. No longer is it a world of saying nothing at all. You know, the, the first Bank of England press officer was told that his job was to keep the press out of the bank and the bank out of the press. Now, it's a much more open world You've done a lot of communicating. I mean, you've, you've talked about the appearances before Congress. You give press conferences after FOMC meetings. You give speeches and so on. What, in your view, is the objective of all this communication? And how do you translate that objective into a strategy for communication? So I'd say the objectives are twofold. Um, first, a powerful, independent, um, institution that controls a key economic policy tool in a democratic <clears throat> society has an obligation to communicate to the public and to members of Congress to make clear what it's doing, what the objectives of policy are, and what the logic is of the policies that are being followed. So. This is a matter of transparency, accountability, and legitimacy of an organization that's been given a great deal of responsibility and independence to carry it out. Second, I'd say communication is extremely important in making policy effective. That, um, mm -hmm what market participants and members of the public think the future holds in store um, matters greatly to how they behave and to actual market conditions. So uh, it's important to communicate clearly to markets and to the public so that the expectations um, that market participants form are ones that tend to enhance the effectiveness of policy. So, for example, just um, communicating clearly that we have an inflation objective, that we are committed to an inflation objective, that it's 2%. Most central banks these days do that, but um, I think a record of good performance and that clear commitment has helped to anchor inflation expectations around 2%. And that's been important because not only has it helped to keep inflation low and stable in most advanced economies, um, it's also given central banks um, much more freedom to use monetary policy to focus on employment. 
Uh, for example, if you have a negative oil shock, one that raises oil prices and temporarily boosts inflation, um, it would be a bad thing if a central bank had to tighten monetary policy because a, a burst of inflation that ought to be temporary raised inflation expectations and then set the economy off on an inflationary spiral. When inflation expectations are well anchored, um, that doesn't occur, and it's not necessary for a central bank then to tighten policy. And that's certainly something the Fed's done is essentially ignored <coughs> temporary shocks to inflation. Um, importantly, um, long-term interest rates, which govern many spending and investment decisions, um, depend importantly on the path of short-term interest rates that market participants expect over time. So the actual setting of the short-term interest rate today doesn't matter very much to financial conditions. What matters is what market participants think the strategy will be for setting short-term interest rates over time. And so an important objective that I have is to try to help market participants form expectations about what the policy strategy is, is and how the Fed is likely to respond to shocks to the economy. And I think that speeds the trend and makes monetary policy more effective. So different audiences, different objectives, that means we communicate in a whole variety mm -hmm. of ways, press conferences, um, public speeches, some to very lay audiences mm -hmm. that don't understand a lot about the Fed or monetary policy to explain who we are and what we do, some to more sophisticated audiences. Um, we have some presence in social media as well and um, are increasingly using those tools to communicate to broader audiences. And, and you've traveled around the U.S. talking to a number of different communities and cities, and this is the lay audience that you have in mind. Yes. I mean, I meet with a whole variety of different groups. Um, you know, for example, I meet with groups like the Commonwealth Club. I've been to Rotary Clubs to speak to, you know, groups of citizens who are in no way specialists in financial markets, but are, you know, just generally interested in understanding the economy and policy, um, and also to more sophisticated audiences. Um, you know, I also, you know, I'm very interested in the job market, and a lot of my career has been spent um, studying unemployment and thinking about how we can try to lower it. And um, sometimes I speak to um, groups, community development professionals who were working in communities with people who were finding it very challenging to get a foot in the job market and um, get, get jobs and move up, and especially when unemployment is high. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I often meet with community groups as mm. well. Now, Janet, you are a local girl. Yes. Born in Brooklyn. <laughs> Went to yes. Fort, Fort <laughs> Hamilton High School. When you did your PhD at Yale, you were the only woman in the graduating class. You then went to Harvard to teach. There weren't many women on the faculty. There weren't actually that many women amongst the graduate students. How difficult was it to be, both to work and compete in such a male-dominated environment? So... You know, I would say I've had a very good career in economics. And, um, you know, sort of studying hard, making sure that I'm prepared for things. I think these are my trademarks. And um, th they are traits that um, I probably had going back to my Fort Hamilton High School days. Mm -hmm. um, and I found they have served me well throughout my <coughs> career. But when I do look back on things and, th and think about um, in, in what ways do women face difficulties in the field, uh, I guess one of the things I focus on is mentoring. Mm -hmm. I 
I do think it's very important for um, young people in the field to have more senior people who were watching out for them and who were trying to teach them and encourage them and help them succeed. Um, and especially for women in a field that has very few women, I think that can be a very difficult thing. For me, as a graduate student, um, I was a student of an economist by the name of James Tobin at Yale, who was really a, a wonderful person mm. and served as a tremendous mentor to me. He was a macroeconomist. He'd been on the Council of Economic Advisors. He was a Nobel Prize winner, and he really encouraged me throughout my career. Um, I guess I've also, um, I'm married to an economist. Um, my husband has also, in many ways, been a mentor or at least a supporter. Mm. And as I look back, I think that's also been important to my career. He has encouraged me. Um, when I've been offered jobs in Washington, for example, his attitude has been, you want to do that? Absolutely. We're going to make it work. And we've worked jointly together for many years writing papers. And I think that's, that's important. It, you know, when I've evaluated and talked to female graduate students and um, looked at women and the barriers they face, um, I think, you know, often in our field, for example, co-authorship is something that's very important. People do research. They tend to do research in teams. They write papers together. They talk to one another. They come up with ideas. Then they start working on those ideas together. And I think a way in mm -hmm. which women are, are somewhat disadvantaged is that it's often during social interactions that those conversations take place. The guys go out and have a beer, and then they start talking about a topic. Mm. Right. And by the time it's over, they've got an idea, mm. and they're writing a paper together. And I think that often for women, they're less well integrated into those social networks, those casual social mm -hmm. networks. I mean, sort of more broadly, looking at um, women in economics, look at undergraduates in the United States in economics. Um, I believe about 30% of economics undergrad majors are women. And it's hard to understand why that is so low. I mean, so women are n not going into <coughs> economics in the numbers that I think they should be. Um, this also applies to underrepresented minorities. Um, I do think it's important in the economics profession is beginning to focus more attention on how to encourage women and minorities to become interested in the field and to teach it in ways that um, mm -hmm. make, it, make it an attractive major and c career for women and minorities. And you know, I think it's not only important for women and minorities themselves in terms of um, their ability to have successful careers, but I would say it's important to the profession that the work, the research that we do will be um, improved because of diversity. At the Fed, we are very committed to diversity and inclusion and um, are really spending a lot of time trying to make sure that um, we have an atmosphere that we recruit, that we work with people and have an atmosphere that um, promotes mm. diversity and inclusion. Now, you've had not just a good career as an economist, but a pretty extraordinary one. Um, I've been lucky. <laughs> so when did you decide that you wanted to be an economist? And have you been surprised by how your career has evolved on the way? So um, I guess I decided I wanted to be an economist when I was an undergraduate at Brown. Um, I went to Brown thinking that I was going to major in math. Mm -hmm. um, and I always liked, <clears throat> I always liked math. Um, but then I discovered economics. And economics is a field that does use um, rigorous analytic techniques, um, empirical methods, and um, modeling that requires or uses math. 
But what I loved about economics was that it's also a field that has an impact on and is concerned with social, social welfare and economic well-being. And so it was a combination of being about people and their lives and concerned with um, what makes for good, good lives and good careers. Um, and it also used, used math and reasoning in, in a way that I liked. And I guess that's, that's when I became interested in economics. I was always interested in macroeconomics. My parents had lived through the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. When I studied <clears throat> macroeconomics and I discovered that economists thought they had tools that could prevent episodes like the Great Depression with um, chronic high unemployment. I really saw that this was a field that could make a great difference to human welfare. And I always understood that monetary and fiscal policy were the tools that one would use. I suppose I never expected early on that I would end up in jobs um, where I had that kind of policy making mm -hmm. responsibility, but I did understand there were those jobs. But I expected to be an academic, and I um, pursued an academic career, and I was on the faculty at Berkeley for many years. And then in 1994, I think it was, the phone rang, and it was someone from the Clinton administration asking me, might I be interested in serving as a governor? Well, I ne I'd never really contemplated serving as a governor, but um, at some level I thought, okay, th what I've studied and the research that I've done is relevant to it. And um, I asked my spouse, what do you think about moving to Washington? And he said, absolutely, we'll make it work. And I said, yes, and have never been sorry. And I guess as I've thought, so that's a change in my career, and hmm. it took me in a different direction, direction in a policy direction. And you know, I guess when I thought about changes like that in my career, um, I've kind of asked myself the question, the questions, well, um, you know, how do I feel about the work? Is it something I feel like I could wake up every morning and feel really excited about going to work and, wor and addressing this set of problems and issues? Um, certainly in the case of monetary policy and, um, you know, the public service that I've done, the answer is absolutely. Then I kind of asked myself, what about the institution? How do I feel about the institution? Mm -hmm. Is it one I admire and respect? And certainly in the case of the Federal Reserve, the answer is a resounding yes. I, you know, I admire what it stands for. And then, of course, there are people you work with every day. And... Um, I asked myself, well, what do I think about the people I work with? And I'd say, you know, it's been for me um, just a total pleasure to be in the Fed. I'm surrounded by smart, dedicated, um, public-spirited people who are just a lot of fun to brainstorm with. And sometimes people have asked me, um, what do you like about your job? What don't you like about your job? And... Um, I tend to tell them, well, you know, my calendar's in the public domain. Um, and so you, you can look and see how I spend my days. And there are days when you'll see 9 o'clock meet with staff, 10 o'clock meet with staff. It goes yeah. that way all the way down. I see, you know, my mind, that, that's a good day. That's a good day for me because um, the staff I work with, they're all really smart. And we talk about interesting yeah. questions yeah. and so my, my career's taken some unexpected turns, but it's, it's been very satisfying. Now, this is a chance, perhaps the final one, to send the questions along the aisles. Any more questions, send them along, and they'll be collected before they come to me. Uh, Janet, you belong to a family of economists. Um, your husband's an economist. Your son is an economist. <laughs> In fact, you and your husband both have, uniquely, honorary doctorates from the London School of Economics. Very proud of that. This is the economics equivalent of Andre Agassi and Steffi Graf being the, the only husband and wife combination to win Wimbledon singles titles. So what do you do to get away from economists at times? Now, why would you want to do that? <laughs> There's got to be a moment, surely. 
Well, I, I confess we do spend a lot of time talking about economics. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it is the bread and butter of our daily lives. My, um, my, my son teaches at the University of Work. Um, fortunately, we're not in all in exactly the same, same field. fields. Yep. My husband and I did work together for a long time, but now my son's interests overlap more strongly with my husband. So, um, well, we do, we, do, we do spend a lot of time talking about economics. My son was, I suppose, doomed to be an economist. He had two <laughs> parents. Um, he was an only child. He had two parents who were economists. He is also very good at math and, you know, shares our interests. And um, we often even took him on trips where we were doing research and will confess even on vacations we sometimes sit around uh, a beach reading econ all of us reading economics books and working on our computers but um, we 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 like to cook at least my son and I enjoy cooking together um, we occasionally go on hikes um, we enjoy family and friends and we like to travel so we do some things that are not economics, but we may have a heavier dose of economics in our diet than some would find appetizing. <laughs> Splendid. So I think now the time is ready to take in some of your questions. So, Beth, do you have questions that I can select from there? Right. Gosh, we shall get through all of these. Oh, my God. But uh, what can we see here? Um, so here's a question from a clinical professor at Stern, Paul Hardham. What do you consider the biggest threat to the stability of the global markets? You can just do that in 30 seconds. That would be good. <laughs> the biggest threat to the stability of the global markets. Global markets. Yes. Um, well, th the financial crisis that we had was a... Uh, um, took an enormous toll and um, you know the potential for financial stability instability to um, arise again due to inadequate supervision and regulation or developments outside the regulated sectors in the shadow banking sector um, will always remain threats I think we need to be vigilant about So here's a question from uh, an NYU undergraduate. Do you see interest on reserves as the new normal or something that will come to an end? Okay, so interest, that's a great question. Um, interest on reserves is um, payments that we make to banks who have deposits with us. This is um, a power that um, we gained or a tool that was given to us at the beginning of the financial crisis. And we needed that tool in order to um, undertake asset purchases. So um, we, as the economy began to deteriorate after, uh, in the height of the financial crisis, we quickly, by the end of 2008, lowered our short-term interest rate to zero, mm. uh, effectively zero. And the economy still see seemed to need um, more accommodation than we were able to provide. So we wanted to undertake asset purchases, and we ended up doing that in large scale. But then we had the problem of if we were to do that and the economy recovered, we knew we would need to have the capacity to raise short-term interest rates again. I suppose hypothetically, if the economy recovered, we could have turned around and started selling assets and only after we had sold them off, begin to raise interest rates. But I think that would have been a dangerous course. So having the power to set interest on reserves, to pay interest to banks, we knew would be critical to being able to adjust short-term interest rates with a large balance sheet. And it is currently our key policy tool. We absolutely need it. Um, there has been discussion 
um, in Congress about taking that power away, and I've argued very strenuously against it, um, we would not be able to control short-term interest rates now if we did not have that power. Um, if it were to disappear, we would really have to change our monetary policy strategy and probably start quickly selling off assets to gain control of short-term interest rates. That would be very disruptive. So I think the question said something about the new normal. Yep. I think the new normal needs to be that we will retain that power and keep it as our main monetary policy tool. And, and that is in line with what most other central banks that, do. That is. Now a question from Kent Kai, a Stern undergraduate sophomore. What other methods for shrinking the balance sheet besides letting assets mature are there and what are the likely reactions in markets to different methods of shrinking the balance sheet? So we have a large balance sheet that consists of uh, U.S. Treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities guaranteed by Fannie and Freddie. Um, really, there are only two ways of shrinking the balance sheet. One is as um, we receive principal payments on those securities, instead of reinvesting the principal, we can redeem some of it. And that's what we, uh, we are doing and have set out a plan to do. The alternative would be to actually actively sell securities that we hold in our portfolio in the markets. And um, we have in the past contemplated selling assets and thought that we might do so. But uh, over the last year or two, as we've come closer to beginning the process of shrinking our balance sheet, um, we decided that the least disruptive um, path we could follow would be to gradually just shrink our balance sheet probably over a span of four or five years by redeeming principal rather than actively selling securities. So um, I think it's least, least disruptive from the standpoint of <clears throat> markets. There's no real need to shrink it more rapidly than that. Um, we've waited to do that until we um, had raised our federal funds rate well above the zero bound and thought the economy um, is on a good, good and robust course mm -hmm. so that if there's a negative shock, we could cut the federal funds rate. But we felt that that was the best strategy. We could also sell securities, but that's not our intention to do that. Two MI students have asked essentially the same question. Why is it that inf inflation is so low at the same time as unemployment is as low as 4%? So that, that um, is historically unusual. Um, often when unemployment is as low as it is now, inflation is higher or shows signs of moving up. Now, my own view is that it has not been a mystery uh, for the past, so inflation has been low for a number of years, but I don't think it has been a mystery. <clears throat> so first, unemployment was very high, and we had slack in the labor market that was depressing inflation, and that is typically what we see. Um, then we had a massive decline in oil prices that pushed inflation down for several years. And starting in 2014, there was a huge appreciation of the dollar. And that pushed down import prices and held down inflation. So when you go back and you look at each year, 2016, 2015, 14, and look at was there a mystery, I would say the answer is no. For all those years, inflation was lower than we wanted it to be, but it wasn't surprising. This year, low inflation is surprising because we're at essentially full employment with a 4.1% unemployment rate. Oil prices have been stable. The dollar has been roughly stable. Um, inflation is surprisingly low. But I guess what I would say and what the working hypothesis of um, our committee is, is that, look, there are other factors, a whole range of 
um, idiosyncratic kind of factors, most of which may, may be temporary transitory things that affect inflation other than um, slack in the labor market, oil prices in the dollar. For example, for several years now, healthcare costs have been rising less rapidly than they typically do, um, partly because of changes related to the Affordable Care Act. Okay, that may be a big enough sector that that's had an influence, but one that's likely to be transitory. Um, earlier this year in March and April, um, the way in which uh, phone companies, mobile phone companies, charge for data plans. Um, they began to offer unlimited data, and although nobody really saw their um, cell phone bill change a whole lot, the statisticians at the Bureau of Labor Statistics decided that that was really a massive decline in the effective cost of cell phone services and that caused a very large decline in prices. So there are, there are idiosyncratic factors, I would hypothesize, that are holding it down this year. Uh, we expect to, it to move back up over the next year or two. Mm -hmm. But I will say I am very uncertain about this. My colleagues and I are not certain that it is transitory and we are monitoring inflation very closely. And I'll go back to what I said earlier about keeping an open mind and yep. not assuming you have a monopoly on truth. Um, it may be that there is something more endemic or long-lasting mm -hmm. here that we need to pay attention to. Next question. To what extent does U.S. monetary policy take into account the policy of other central banks around the world? Well... Mervyn, as you, you know, we, Mervyn and I um, met with all of our colleagues uh, six times a year at the Bank for International Settlements and um, in other international forums and uh, exchange views on our economies and try to help one another uh, understand monetary policies. And certainly for us at the Fed, in our setting of monetary policy, we do take into account many factors affecting the economic outlook, and the monetary policies of other countries are among those factors. So, I mean, for example, at the moment, um, long-term interest rates are quite low. Um, in part, that's because of our own asset purchases, which and large holdings of longer-term assets, which um, we undertook purposely in order to push down long-term rates, and I believe we were successful. But um, there are also massive asset purchases that are taking place in the euro area and in Japan, and I would say that most research suggests that there are spillovers across economies, and that those asset purchases elsewhere are also helping to hold down our rates. And that is a factor that we need to take account of and do take account of. Um, we know that our own monetary policy has spillovers to other countries, including to emerging markets. There have been periods in which um, inadvertently um, our policies have probably led to negative spillovers. And I would say also we do try to um, communicate clearly about our policies and to try to minimize uh, negative spillovers to other countries. Who has been the most influential economist in your life? <laughs> well, as I said, James Tobin was a um, mentor of mine and a great economist. And um, part of what he did was he, w he was very influenced by Keynes, um, read the general theory as an undergraduate, and it shaped his career, which in many ways was working out the implications of Keynesian economics for um, economic policy in the United States. And, you know, for me, that's a tradition that I feel very much part of. 
so I too have been very influenced by Keynes and particularly by Tobin with whom I study. Mm. So I think moving on probably to the final question, you've met many people, uh, many imp very important people around the world, but one student here wants to know, who is the most interesting person you have ever met? <laughs> the most interesting yes. person? <laughs> uh, that is a very that is a very hard question. Um, well, I would say my spouse is an extremely yes. interesting person. <laughs> uh, um, I met him in um, the Fed cafeteria one day when I was on the staff. Um, I found him extremely interesting. He has an unusual mind, yes, and is somebody who thinks very much outside the box. Yes. Um, <clears throat> he, um, he, you know, his ideas would probably not suit him very well for the kind of job that you and I have <laughs> held, but he, you know, he's a very distinguished yeah. academic and has um, gone in a lot of unusual and creative directions and um, we ended up getting engaged after six weeks. Um, <laughs> and you must have discussed a lot of economics in that period. <laughs> well, and it's been it's been interesting. It's been interesting ever since thirty eight years later. So, uh, <laughs> once so. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, you have had a chance yourself this evening to see the extraordinary clarity of exposition which reflects a clarity of thinking that I had the privilege to see every six times a year and on other occasions over many years. And it's, Janet, it's not just well prepared. This clarity of thought has been it was vital and it was, it, it, to me it, it, it dominated our discussions in Basel. So I want to thank you, Janet, not just for coming to Stern tonight, which has been a great privilege for all of us, but on behalf of the audience here tonight, the people of this country, and actually the people around the world, to thank you for your service and your leadership during your time at the Fed. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again, Chair Yellen and Lord King, for an inspiring and informative discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats while Chair Yellen and Lord King exit the auditorium.